Kia ora tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko o Henny Rau te manga, ko Timutuku te moana no tamaki aho, ko ta Rob toko papa, ko Fenwick toko fano, ko Izzy toko ingoa. Kia ora, my name is Izzy, and I have the pleasure of moderating this exceptional uh, panel today, discussing what is front of mind for these rangatahi and their thoughts on the intergenerational approach needed for Auckland. And before I start, I just want to reiterate why this intergenerational approach is so important. Some of you will have heard me say this already, but you know, currently around 60% of the world's population is under 35. The generations that make up this group are quickly becoming a powerful force, and the momentum behind them begging for change is colossal. For they are the ones that have the most to gain or lose from the development of, of Auckland, Aotearoa, and the rest of the world. Despite being the biggest cohort, they are the most underrepresented demographic when it comes to our decision-making spaces, our strategic conversations, and our governance circles. And this representation is not just about diversity. The unique life experiences of these generations have created innate characteristics that impact how they see the world. Digital pioneers and digital natives, these generations were born into a time of massive technological growth the development of artificial intelligence, the unimaginable rise of social media, data-enabled experiences, and digital services. They've also witnessed the growing panic and awareness of our natural degradation and the climate crisis, and they've seen the world come to its knees by an invisible enemy, COVID. Due to these unique life experiences, these generations are known for being the most progressive, creative, and far-thinking generations to date. As some of you know, in the last few months, I launched an organization that establishes next generation advisory panels to act as advisory assets and guides for major New Zealand-based organizations wanting to become better ancestors and take a more intergenerational approach to the way they do things. One of the questions I get asked a lot is, where are you gonna find this rangatahi, this next generation talent? And I'm gonna tell you what I tell them and that is that Aotearoa is absolutely bursting with next generation talent, and finding them is the absolute least of my concerns. So in a minute, I'm gonna introduce you to some of them, but first I wanna remind you of what an incredible opportunity this intergenerational approach could be, and the risk that you face if you fail to recognize the importance of the values and principles and bravery of the next generation. So here are some of those brave rangatahi. Dewey Sakian is a climate activist, lawyer, and sustainability strategist and consultant. After project managing a relief mission in the aftermath of Super Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, Dewey started working on disaster management, climate change policy, and grassroots campaigning. She facilitated academic research, published policy briefs, participated at the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change COP negotiations, sold premier electric vehicles via Tesla, and campaigned for the Zero Carbon Act through Generation Zero. As a young lawyer, strategist, and activist, she is passionate about using her skills to properly enforce New Zealand's environmental commitments. Next, we have B Bella Cunningham. By day, Bella spends her energy committed to helping Toi Tu Tahua, the Centre for Sustainable Finance, transform the financial system in Aotearoa, New Zealand, to one that is sustainable, equitable, and inclusive, as their partnership's associate. By night, Bella is studying leading change for good and is a global shaper in the World Economic Forum Auckland Hub. And lastly, we have Pock. Pok Wei Hing is a climate change and sustainability consultant at EY with a focus on sustainability strategies and modern slavery. Outside of work, he serves on the Strategic Council of Climate Catalyst alongside the former Prime Minister of Kiribati and UN high-level champion of COP26, and is a design partner with the World Economic Forum on Climate Justice. Constantly learning and unlearning, he is currently engaged on creating a regenerative framework for Auckland centered on learning from indigenous wisdom and development within planetary boundaries. You will also see that I am one wahini down on the panel today, Shazaya Salem. Shazaya Whakapapa's Tanati Fatua Orake, and as many of you know, a really significant passing happened this week with Joe Hawke. So Shazaya is with the Fano on the Marae, but she wanted me to take this opportunity to share some of her thoughts. When she and I first spoke about an intergenerational approach, she talked about ako. In Tao Māori, the concept of ako means both to teach and learn. It recognizes the knowledge that both teachers and learners bring to learning interactions as a shared learning experience, 
and it represents a reciprocal, non-hierarchical relationship. This is also known as the tuakana taina relationship, a Māori practice referring to the relationship between an older, a tuakana, and a younger, a taina, and the way that ako enables those tuakana taina roles to be reversed at any time. But the point that Shazaya really wanted me, me to make was that um, while the growing recognition and popularity of embedding Tao Māori practices and principles and frameworks into businesses is great, be intentional in making that and recognising that if you actually want to start building a culture that reflects these practices or any Tao Māori principle or value system, you should actually just employ more Māori. And if you think you've tried, well, as Yoda said, do or do not, there is no try. So let's get this party, I mean panel started. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, we're going to start with you. So um, tell us about what's front of mind for you in this space. Sure. Well, kia ora, magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. Ako si Dewey Sakayan. Kia ora, ko mayon te maunga, ko ilo pasig te awa, ko Manila, Pilipinas, me tamaki makoro aho, ko Dewey toka ingoa. Um, Izzy, yeah. what's front of mind for me right now, as we've heard um, throughout the day, is the need to create a safe space and a clear framework of accountability when it comes to decision making um, that includes intergenerational voices and the youth of and the voice of the youth right now. We've seen in the report um, that you, all of you will see in front of um, in printed copies in front of you and online that there was this idea of a commission on future generations, which I thought was really interesting, and I wanted to give like a nuanced take on it because before we do create a commission on future generations, we must first think about what has systematically failed us that we need something else, mm. right? And for all of you in the room right now who might be thinking, ah, we always need to consult with the youth. I'm here to, to tell you now about how consultation sometimes is so important, but often what fails engagement with the youth effectively. And so what's front of mind for me when it comes to decision-making process is this experience of mine from, um, from last year mm -hmm. when um, I was asked for four hours of my time um, on a transport-related policy, and that was going to be during work hours. Um, I was only um, invited uh, along with two other people, and on top of that, they couldn't tell me how anything that I would say would actually be incorporated into the plan, which mm -hmm. meant, in other words, for me, that it was just tacked on at the very end of the consultation process. Mm -hmm. And so that in itself, became so crucial in my mind that if you want young people to be in that table with you, firstly, you need to think about, is that table suited for young people? Is that a safe space for us? And if not, then how can we redefine that, what that table looks like? And could it even be a table, mm. right? And so that in itself is what's front of me, particularly because I'm looking around the room right now and I'm always trying to find what that connection would look like to each and every single one of you and each and every single organization that I'm seeing up in the, up in the stands over here. What does that decision-making process look like in terms of including the youth um, throughout that process, right? Is that consultation truly encouraging youth to be part of it? Or is it just a tick boxing event mm. that happens once um, the solution is already ready to go public, right? We want to co-design these solutions. We want to take charge of our futures because we are the future. And so why don't we work together to actually redefine what that table looks like, come and meet us where it's suited for youth and see how it actually works in our world and in our mindset. Mm. So Kia I ora. think, I I think that. that's something that this group and this cohort, particularly with the actions that we can see right now in the report, has a big action point from tomorrow moving forward. Mm, nice, beautiful. What about for you, Bella? Um, I really enjoyed reading the report, and additionally, I recognise the role in um, you know organisations kind of departing from the traditional top-down and quite linear approach to implementing change. Mm. Um, I suppose that when we look at, you know, engaging into dialogue with the younger generation, or generations, should I say, um, I have to agree with Dewey in the fact that we need to create accessible, you know, processes and conditions to allow that dialogue to be productive mm. rather than tokenistic or a tick box exercise. I have to say that, 
you know, thinking about the younger generation, we've grown up living in and um, being raised in a technological world. And what that's meant is that we've been so um, collaborative with our peers from across the world, kind of this global village that we've been able to learn from. And I suppose I see that as a key way that we we're quite naturally used to partnership and learning from one another. And I suppose our invitation for you is to say, if these societal and these um, climate issues are affecting more than one generation, they're not just affecting one generation, why would the solutions be mm. created by one generation or a couple of generations, right? So I think what's top of mind for me is, you know, very similar to you, Dewey, is how can we better engage and more thoughtfully engage with the younger generation in a way that does feel reciprocal and in a way that benefits both people, um, both kind of groups. Mm. Um, growing up in Auckland, I was born and raised here, I'm really proud of our city, but I also recognise that there's not many pathways that youth can identify to see themselves um, co-create and partner with older generations um, to share our perspectives. So, you know, we want to talk to you. We are here, we kind of acknowledge our role in reviving the customs, the traditions, um, and the processes that are needed to reshape the systems that aren't currently working. We're ready, we're eager, and we're quite um, open to this conversation, this korero, and we, we welcome you here, right? We want to meet you where you are, and we ask the same back. So mm. that's kind of what's top of mind for me. Kia ora. And when you say it like that, it's so obvious. If the issue affects more than that generation, more than that generation should be at the table to discuss it. So I love that. Park, what about you? Yeah, uh, I think I'll start with um, taking a moment to extend my deepest sympathies to Fano and um, Iwi Nati Fatua Rake on Joe Hawke's passing. Uh, e te rangatira yeah. moe mai rā. Uh, ngā mihi ki nui ki a koutou, uh, tēne ka mihi ki te mana whenua o tēne rohe, uh, ki a Nati Fatua o Rake, uh, te mana whenua, te mana tangata ki te mihi. Uh, o te ranga iwi katoa, ko tae mai uh, toitunga tūtohu whenua o Tamaki Makaurau, uh, whanui tēnā koutou. Uh, no haina o ku tupuna, uh, engari ko Hingapoa te ukaipo. Uh, ko pok tuku ingoa, uh, no reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, so within that mihi, uh, mihi to Ngāti Whātua o Rāke, mihi to um, the different iwis across Tamaki Makaurau, they're part of our future as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And a bit about me, um, my ancestors are from China. Uh, and I'm actually from Singapore. So I spent 20 years of my life in Singapore, five years in New Zealand. So really new immigrant, uh, really excited with this discussion. Uh, two things, honestly, you have two amazing panelists ahead <laughs> of me that just went off and I, I'm not gonna, uh, they, they were just amazing. I think a point on leadership is now uh, on intergenerational leadership. If we were to reflect on that video that was shown first thing in the morning, I think one thing that stood out to me, even as someone who's just 20 something, is the clarity of our kids. It's the clarity of the vision that they want and the clarity of the problems. And the way to solve lies with the power structures that, and the social capital that we hold. That's our responsibility. That's what we need to work. And we need to partner across generations to actually reach the masses, to have that policy change, that structure change, systems change that we want. So I think the first thing is on intergenerational uh, leadership. I could go on about um, climate, that is what I do, uh, but I think we'll, we'll delve into that deeper later on. I think another point as well is, as, uh, as a migrant, thriving in a multicultural and super diverse Tamaki Makoto, that is, that is our superpower. We'll mm -hmm. have to deeply reflect on how we have over 200 ethnicities and one of the most super diverse cities in the world. How are we gonna thrive what are the barriers and what are the challenges and opportunities to social cohesion? Mm. Um, this is our future, and mm. it's our future now. Kia ora. Awesome, Park. Dewey, I've seen a, a question pop up, and it's something that you actually spoke a little bit about already, and I guess sort of building into some of the um, tactical ways that, that youth engagement can be really meaningful and productive. Be keen to hear you share a couple more of, the, of your thoughts in that space. Sure. Um, so for those of you cannot see. The question is, are there <laughs> exemplars of good engagement with Rangatahi? And one thing that I will say now is I am representing Generation Zero here, and I think that we do engagement and mobilization the best. <laughs> um, Kia ora. And to give you an example in terms of how we did it then, we just held a party. 
right? This is how we did it when it came to the Zero Carbon Act. We knew that we needed to mobilize people across different um, localizations, um, across different businesses, across different backgrounds to come together and support this. And so what we held was we, what we held was this submission party, right? We had a submission party wherein it was educational, it was a mixture of fellowship, it was a mixture of creating a safe space for young people to just pur purge their eco emotions, but also it was a safe space for us to come together and put together a vision for the future and act towards it right there, right now. Um, and back to Bella's point, in that party, we actually had so many different people. I had Lolas, Lolas are um, grandmas in Tagalog. Um, I had Lolas come over with their, um, with their food. We had um, uncles and aunties come over with their, um, yeah, with their nieces and nephews um, to come together with us. It was fantastic. And that in itself was also just held in a community hall not in a boardroom, not in a space wherein we would feel as though we need to spend four hours of our working time or our school time to go and be part of that table, mm. right? If anything, we chuck the table away and we just let everyone come into the space and into the floor. And that in itself was a good way in terms of putting together and putting us in the center of the decisions that we are creating for the future. Um, and so perhaps that is one way in which we need to rethink about how do we actually engage with people differently, mm. right? Is our future going to be in circle tables like this or is it going to be in parties? Nice. <laughs> Hopefully more parties. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and um, I think there's something in there as well that really talks about a, a, a different way of prioritizing value and sort of how we place value and, and where we see that, both as individuals and, and organizations. And um, Bella, I'm, I'm keen to hear from you what you think about how we reflect on our value systems as individuals and organizations in order to be creating spaces that are going to be more inclusive to an intergenerational approach. Sure. Well, I think the video at the start of the day is a great example to show, you know, ha what children, what ta our tamariki value and what we can learn from that in terms of reflecting on our own personal values, um, be that through our roles, but also in our home life, right? So, you know, in our organisations, how do we value human capital and how do we value nature capital, natural capital? So if we think about um, the children this morning, you know, they very clearly spoke about the environment being of such importance to them. I'm not here to say that you don't value the environment, but to what degree is that a priority to you? I think there's so much to learn from the childlike um, kind of approach to looking at you know, the curiosity over why we do things. So children are always asking why, 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 um, and they're constantly questioning and learning what they value, right? They're shaping this through their experiences. And I think that with time, you know, it's easy for us to be sterilized by the systems which we are in. And I encourage us all, please indulge me, you know, reflect on when you were a child and reflect when you were that age and what was so, so important to you. Was it the simple things of life um, or was it, you know, the, th the problems you're facing today and, and how can we use that to come back home to who we truly are and what we truly value? Um, so I just think there's so much to learn from, you know, our tamariki and, and how we value these um, natural and human capitals. Mm, kia ora. Pak, did you want to add anything in terms of how that video impacted you? I know that the three of us were together when we first watched that and it hit us pretty hard. Yeah, um, I think I just want to add actually a point in Bella. Um, when I joined Climate Catalyst with the Strategic Council, um, I was the youngest person on that board. Everyone was twice my age. And I remember asking the chairman, I was like, I have no idea. I, I applied, I got it, but I have no idea what, what qualifies me for this because I'm, I'm extremely, extremely bored young. And he actually said to this, and this gives me confidence to be here today, and he was saying, you know, people look at young people and they see naivety. I look at it and I see not naivety, I see clarity. And that is honestly the only sentence that gives me motivation to, to speak here today. Um, a sense of clarity that perhaps I may possess in um, the values that I hold dear and the change I want to see in the world, that's what I want to bring forward. And mm. if you want to look at kids, their clarity is just unmatched, like it's exponential. And it almost feels as though like <laughs> as the years go by, um, sometimes we, we're guided by other uh, incentives within our structures and mm. our systems. Um, 
going back to that video, uh, I think I felt a little bit, uh, I, you know, I really talked about my heartstrings, and it was a brilliant video, but I also felt a little bit bittersweet. And I think that's because, uh, s you know, they, they were really identifying some crucial topics such as climate change, pollution, and for me, the, the first thought in my head was, wow, since when did an adult problem become an intergenerational thought or intergenerational struggle? Mm -hmm. Like, these are our kids, six, seven, eight years old, playing on the swing, and yet seeing that pollution is a, is a problem out there. Or they're learning about math and still having some feelings of eco-emotions, you know, or feeling worried about uh, what the next decade's going to bring for them in terms of the environment. And I think it goes to show that the time for acting is literally now. We've, we've passed the point of comfortable acting. Now is the time of urgent action, of intergenerational dialogue, and mm. I think that's why we're here today. Mm, kia ora. I'm so glad you, you raised that point around eco-emotion, because I, I know all four of us have had you know, uh, uh, challenges in that space, and I do worry about our tamariki having yet another challenge, which is going to be this concept of, of equal emotions. And, and Julie, I'm, I'm really keen for you to share some of your experiences in, in that space as well. Sure. Um, I've been in the climate, uh, climate justice space for the last nine years. It started in Takloban, Haiyan, back in 2013. Um, and I guess I was really in the midst of looking at what climate, ju climate change impacts look like um, by way of a disaster, by way of an aftermath, of looking at houses being thrown into bricks, um, of trees being pulled down, of corpses literally lying on the ground, of container ships on the, um, on the streets and cars on the water. And so all of those things really affected affected me and I have lost within that last within the last nine years I've lost count of how many people have asked me as to why I'm still in this space um, as to how they could e explain climate change to their kids without um, um, scaring them but also I've had numerous students ask me is it okay to feel angry all the time right all of those are actually so telling in terms of the fact that we need to move away from eco anxiety which is just one form of emotion to eco emotions and there are number of tips that you know i mean if you don't mind i want to share with the mm. rest of you and i would love to also see if anyone could resonate with this because within those nine years, it's always been a matter of how do we check ourselves so that we can, if we're working towards sustainability, we also need towards, to work towards our own sustainability. Mm, mm. Um, and so the first thing that I try to do when it comes to, when it comes to feeling those eco emotions is to name them, right? What am I feeling? When I was in Takloban, am I helping out of fear and anger because of climate change or am I working out of love and empathy for the victims. Um, when I name those eco-emotions, I'm actually acknowledging that I have them, mm -hmm. right? When you acknowledge that you have them, you're not suppressing it inside. And so that in itself really helped me really pinpoint, okay, what is triggering, triggering me right now and what am I acting out of? Mm. The second thing is to find your homie, right? Or your allies. Find the people who you could actually speak to about those emotions, right? Um, purge them out of those, um, purge them out of you and with your homie. Because at the end of the day, they could help you go through that process of understanding, but also living out and finding hope. And so, again, in the last nine years, I've been very lucky, but also I've been very intentional in terms of finding who those homies are in my life throughout the different ages, throughout the different stages that I've had, university, um, you know, as a young professional, and even today. Um, I look across different sectors in the Philippines, in New Zealand, in the business sector, in the government, in literally younger people. Um, I have year nines who are my homies, and I talk to them all the time. Um, and so those are the kind of people who you have to surround yourself with so that you can talk through those emotions with. Mm. The third one, and my favorite one, is to vent and release. So important, vent and release. During the pandemic, why, my way of venting is by way of crying, and that's okay, right? That's okay. Sometimes you just need a big fat cry <laughs> to release whatever is going on in your head. And you know what? The pandemic does that to people, <laughs> right? And we're still in the pandemic now, so cry your heart out. Um, but also, now that we're out um, and we can meet with people, my way of releasing that tension is to actually cook, um, cook food with my friends and mix some nice. cocktails with them and have you know, a little d dinner party. Again, Beautiful. going back to that party session of fellowship. Um, 
And so venting and releasing is so important. Mm. And then the fourth one is taking action. And that in itself is almost this wonderful way of rounding up all those four key t tips in the sense that when you take action, not only are you acknowledging that you are feeling something and that you're feeling this urge to do something out of those emotions, you're, you've got your homie or your allies who you can act with, and you're using action as a way of venting and releasing those emotions into something productive. And yes. so I hope that that's going to be helpful. And if you have any tips for me, I'm happy to keep rehashing that with you all as well. Kia ora. Yeah. What about you, Bella? Do you have anything to add in terms of that eco-emotion space? I suppose I definitely agree about um, being able to find people you can talk to, um, to qu try and understand and almost declare your emotions, but also understand that how we feel about um, you know, climate change or other issues is our own individual experience and the benefit of gaining perspective um, by talking with someone else who's not in our same demographic, not our same um, generation, can be really beneficial to give us perspective around how we experience um, these issues. Um, and can I also pick up on a question yeah. that's come up here? Someone said, do you think leaders are skeptical of engaging rangatahi in decision making because they lack skills and experience? I suppose what I would s link to this conversation um, would be if someone feels as though um, someone uh, within the younger generations doesn't have the same experience or skills, great. I think there's value in that, there's great power in that, because aren't we the ones to grow by learning from different people who have different experience, who have different skills, they, don't, they aren't the same as us, right? So if we're talking to the same people that have the exact same experiences as, as us, it's difficult to understand new, you know, new concepts. I mean, this isn't new for any of you. I bet you, mm. you understand and you appreciate all of that. But I suppose, you know, twist that and look at how that can, we can use that as our power, our superpower. Um, nice. And yeah, I suppose that's, that's a key message I kind of want to get across is that whilst we haven't been on Earth for nearly as long, we've experienced and we've kind of adapted um, in such a rapid way. Um, and there's such power in talking to us and learning from each other because we want to learn, right? We're not here to say that you're the only ones to learn from us. It's kind of that reciprocal like, relationship you spoke to at the start, mm. that ako, that um, to yeah. a kind of tainer relationship. That's what we crave. Nice. There's been some um, pretty heavy stuff on the um, stage today. Uh, and I think even talking about the eco emotions, it kind of, again, also taps back into that sense of hope. And Puck, do you still have hope? You know, that's like a very timely question. As a climate change consultant, literally every few days, we, are, we, ha we, well, we have such a large network of climate change consultants within EY, and we always um, share articles and we're like, oh, another tipping point. Oh, another wildfire. Oh, this is happening. Uh, there's so much mm -hmm. we have to endure and so much we are literally seeing, and, and that's part of our daily life and are part of our daily um, business. But you know, like what gives me hope actually is seeing companies, entities, communities collectively working together on a really, really important goal that's important for the future of our planet. And I, I think like Toitu Tahua is actually um, a timely example of banks really working together to green finance and to finance the green. They're not going to get it perfect, but it's well underway and seeing it happen, you know, it's like that collective effort is what keeps me going. And I think there's always a quote that I always um, refer back to. And, and the quote kind of goes that your hope is only as strong as your struggle. The more you struggle, and by struggle, I mean put in the effort, sacrifice, just like what was pointed out in the very beginning. When you think of what we need to sacrifice to reach that flourishing, thriving future, you know, if we are working together, understanding it's going to be painful in the short term, but fruitful, thriving, flourishing in the future. If we're able to do that, if we're able to rise up to that struggle, then communities will feel hopeful. Society will feel hopeful because at least we tried nice. and we tried our darn hardest. Mm. And I think it's all that matters. Mm. Yeah. Nice. So we've got five minutes left. Mm. I want to ask each of you, what's, what's one action you want to see from this room? And Joey, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, I guess this is more a message, right, yeah, that nice. I want them to take on because 
people here have so many different roles that you, you know what your action is moving forward. But I guess um, to borrow the words of my good friend Alex Johnston from Oxfam International, right? delay is the new climate denial. Right? And if you turn to the people next to you, you know that they would not want to be seen as a lagger or a climate denier. Right? So the time and the pressure is on if we are to meet our goalpost of 2030, which is to halve our emissions. Um, and that in itself is so, um, I guess, telling for me, mainly because, um, as we know um, from the latest Edelman Trust Barometer, um, they found that 73% of people actually um, believe that businesses are the most competent institutions that will act towards climate change, 50% for governments. But also, more, more um, I guess, more important for me as a young person is that I also found that two out of three people will leave their jobs if they find that their employers are not acting fast enough or is not acting at all, right? Can you imagine if within the three um, uh, panelists right here, if two of us literally just walk off the stage? And so that in itself is so clear in terms of what those actions are within your organizations. And I know we've got, um, time is running low, but to take on not a question, but a bold ask, um, if you know that delay is the new climate denial and you're gonna work within your organizations towards climate justice that incorporates the youth, can I please see a show of hands in terms of who among you have a rangatahi panel or an advisory group within your organizations now? I think that's Ara Ake at the back, is that correct? <laughs> yes. Nice. Awesome, only a handful. Where are the rest? Mm. Where are the rest? So that's the action point for mm. me. Nice. <laughs> what about for you, Bella? I would love everyone in this room to you know, leave here or even over lunchtime, think about and identify someone or ask people for someone who's not in the same generation as you, is not in the same demographic as you, identify them and create a strategic relationship with them, that mentorship, mentee mentorship relationship where you can consistently communicate with them and inspire uh, the opportunity to have your challenge, um, your assumptions challenged, sorry. Nice. So look for that relationship, set that up. Um, and commit to that reciprocal relationship so that your thinking is challenged, your assumptions are challenged. Nice. Mm. Park? Um, I'll leave you with a quote and a definite action. The first one it links to its climate action and the urgency, and it's actually that if, firstly, recognizing, we've talked about COVID, we've talked about healthcare, we've talked about technology, there's so many rising issues, but if we delay our spending on the things that matter for a rainy day, then we will surely usher in a flood. Let that sink in for a while. I think it's really important that we know that you can't wait for action now. If you're gonna wait for action now, you're gonna be hit with a flood. No amount of sandbags can save you then. Mm. So the time to mm. act is right now. I think in terms of one definite action, I would encourage you all to take, and a lot of you are decision makers right now, is to consider setting up a shadow board. And a shadow board, and I'll make it even clearer, five to six young professionals within your firm send out an application form, say, we want to create a shadow leadership board that works together with our management to figure out the key priorities that we can launch on, two to three key priorities that we can work on for the next financial year. That is my challenge to you, because the time to act is right now, and at the same time, noticing the clarity of our kids, the time, I think, for intergenerational leadership has never been more opportune. So grab onto us and, and use a, a service like Fennec. Mm. You know, um, get Rangatahi onto your panels, providing an external input and an internal input from your young professionals and watch that magic just blossom. Because whilst you'll be thinking uh, currently within a five-year risk horizon, with that shadow leadership, you might just see what risks you can unearth within a 20, 30 year risk horizon. And that's the start of intergenerational leadership. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Park. And I guess I just want to quickly end on um, what might have felt like a pretty intense session that, you know, as um, Dewey was saying, there is so much hope in our business sector to be leaders in the space and to really step up. So we are um, looking to many of you to um, lead us forward. Mm. Kia ora.